I see our familiar faces. Tracy, welcome to the show. Thank you for joining us again. And it looks like we are live. Excellent. We still have a few attendees joining us, so we'll give another moment or two. Our guest, um, Charles Smith, this evening will be entering the room shortly as well. You're on. Our guest has arrived. In one moment, Charles, we will make you a co-presenter so you can get on camera with us. We just went live on Zoom as well as Facebook, Charles. And if you give us a moment, we're going to do a little bit of an introduction, but welcome. It's great to be here. So I'd like to thank everybody for joining us. As you know, we have been doing 90 days around the world with the New Hampshire Liquor Commission. And we've had a, a great number of weeks of wonderful events with some incredible personalities and celebrities from around the wine world, as well as the spirits world. Um, as you know, we typically host two events each year, one in November, which is the Distiller Showcase. Um, and obviously, generally around this time, I believe it's this coming week, we would have the Winter Wine Spectacular in New Hampshire as well. Um, both those events usually have a thousand or so of our consumers and friends join us to taste various wines and spirits. And it's a great event. Obviously, we couldn't host those this year. So we have been doing the 90 day virtual events. And it's been great. Um, I love seeing all the consumers join us and all of our friends that repeat every week or every night to be able to taste some wine with us. And tonight is, is like many of others, we have a very special guest with Charles Smith here. He'll be tasting six of his wonderful wines. Um, to let everybody know, if you did join us through Zoom and you registered through Zoom, you will uh, receive a coupon for $10 off of three, three bottles if you did not receive that already. And we will have a few giveaways after tonight's event that we will do from all the registered attendees. So thank you for attending. Um, Charles Smith is our guest of honor. Charles, welcome. I, you look good for being in Hawaii. It must be rough. <laughs> yeah, that yeah, look good for being in Hawaii. Not bad, huh? Um, anyways, I was just uh, getting tidied up and uh, good to be here and uh, having this opportunity to travel by way of the internet all the way out to New Hampshire. So nice to see everyone and whoever might be tuning in around the, the country. So anyways, hello, I am Charles Smith. And um, Marissa, did you want to say anything before or we want to just get going? Oh, Marissa, you're, you're muted. You have, unmute, you have to unmute yourself. Yes, I do. You'd think it was the first time doing one of these, huh? Sorry. I would, I would think, wouldn't you? <laughs> with my three teenagers. So um, just in case y'all are wondering, my name is Marissa Sebastianelli. I work for Charles here in the Northeast, um, based out of Massachusetts, but spend a lot of time when I'm able to in the beautiful state of New Hampshire. Uh, I really wanted to just make sure that you all have a true understanding of who Charles is um, before he gets going in the tasting. He is one of the top winemakers in the world. Charles has won Winemaker of the Year from Food and Wine and Wine Enthusiast. In 2017, we had the number two and the number 13 wines on the Wine Spectator Top 100 list, which is absolutely unheard of. Um, Charles is consistently getting scores um, over 95 points from the Wine Spectator, Wine Enthusiast, um, and the Wine Advocate, Jeb Dunnick, James Suckling, et cetera. So we are just, myself, I'm really honored to work for a winemaker from a part of the world, uh, from Washington State, that really is one of the coolest and most up and coming regions of the world, and a place that you can still find these amazing wines that are 95 points and above and amazing quality for, you know, less than $50. Uh, and a lot of our wines and the ones that we're tasting tonight are all under $25 on a regular basis. Great values, but drink like much more expensive wines. So Charles, we're psyched to have you here. And um, thank you. Let's, let's show New Hampshire what our wines are all about. Okie dokie, we can do that. Anyway, so hello everyone. Um, I'm Charles. I'm coming to you from the North Shore of Maui. Uh, no, and I didn't just flee because of COVID. We come here uh, either to uh, Baja, California, or to uh, Hawaii every year after harvest for a little bit about time, about a little bit of time. And so you just happened to catch me on my annual holiday. 
But of course, there's no, when it comes to wine, there is no holiday because wine never sleeps. It just rests in the barrel until we draw it off and we bottle it. So I think first and foremost, if you don't already have wine in your glass, you should do so. And because, I mean, this is kind of a get together situation. So I know the first wine we're gonna start with is a substance uh, Chardonnay. So I just hope you go ahead and pour it in your glass. I hope you have a nice vessel to pour it into. And um, let's ease, ease into it by having a little sip or a big sip or go for what do you feel is appropriate for however your day's been going. And uh, mine is just kind of beginning because it's only 1 p.m. here. Um, but nevertheless, I started off by going to the optometrist with my eight-year-old. So uh, that's what I was doing this morning. And as you know, you kind of just, especially when now a lot of people are working from home, you find yourself kind of intermingling uh, normal uh, home activities with uh, work activities. But for me, this is would be a early lunch at 1 p.m. So I think this is about as good a time as any to start drinking wine. So anyways, cheers to everyone. Thank you for joining us today. And while you enjoy the first wine, and then I'll come back and tell you a little bit about it, I'm just gonna give you an overview about uh, myself and my winemaking so you understand like what you're gonna be drinking as you go along. Let's first and foremost, let's talk about the wine. In my wines, all the vineyards are farm sustainable to biodynamic. And that is in practice, not in word. What does it actually mean? It means I don't spray any chemicals in any of our vineyards whatsoever in any wine that I produce at all. Likewise, in the winery, everything is uh, spontaneous fermentation. What does that mean? It means we don't use any cultured yeast to start the fermentation of our wine. We don't add any other adjuncts or anything else to it. So simply, it's, it's just the grapes and uh, it's fermented with the native yeast that's actually occurring in, in the vineyard. So what does this mean? It means in my wines, there's nothing but the grapes and the vessel they're resting in. So when you talk about purity and you go back before like 1945 when there, were, there wasn't fertilizers and chemicals being used, all wines were produced in this way. And this is why wine throughout the ages have been elevated to be the most you know, desirable drink that there is known to man. And uh, so therefore, why wouldn't I not carry on the way it's been, wine's been produced forever, but with a little bit of insight and, and develop that we learn through, you know, as we, we go along, we learn new things. So essentially what we have, like I said, is the wine is about as pure as you can get. The grapes and the vessel they're resting in. I think it's really important. There's about four things that I think are really key to, to wine in general. And then it comes to drinking them. And the reason why I'm telling you all this is like, I'm kind of just setting the table so we can just you know, you know, try the wines afterward. Um, number one, I think the wine should be ultimately pleasant to drink. Number one, the wine should be pleasant to drink. That's why we're having a glass of wine. We have something really nice to drink. Number two, it should taste like the varietal it was produced from. It should, a Chardonnay should taste like Chardonnay. A Sauvignon Blanc tastes like Chardonnay. Uh, Sauvignon Blanc, a Riesling tastes like a Riesling. You get the point. Third off, it should taste like the place it was grown. For example, this is Chardonnay. And um, you'll find, you, I hope you've already traced it, that you might find that's really pleasant to drink. Number two, it's certainly Chardonnay. And if you knew the profile washed in Chardonnay, you go, well, that's washed in Chardonnay. And the fourth thing is the degree of complexity that wine might have. So that's how elevated it might be. But you can't have two without one. You can't have three without two. So what it really comes down to is just, each thing has to exist. But the, the first and foremost, we should always expect that the wine should be really super pleasant to drink. So in this case, this is a, a really delicious Chardonnay produced from Washington State from a number of vineyards that go up to um, 54 years old, which is from the Rosa Hills vineyard. And, I mean, not the Rosa Hills vineyard, which is actually 48 years old, but also the Moxie vineyard, which actually was uh, rescued at about 52 years old where I took over the vineyard. We, 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 re, we redid everything with the soil. There's 19 acres and we're producing Chardonnay from 58 year old vines that are going in this delicious uh, Chardonnay. The wine was barrel fermented. Um, it doesn't go all the way through malolactic fermentation, you know, that kind of buttery aspect that you might get to it. And sometimes when it kind of started, stopped in the middle of that process, you can smell like, a, you know, kind of like buttered popcorn. Well. I love buttered popcorn, but I don't want to drink it. I, I want to eat it and I want to eat it when I'm at the movies. So the idea for me here is having the inference of richness, but the, in, the, in the, the long and short of it, the wine should just be really balanced and delicious to drink. So 
I'm actually, uh, because I kind of came to this late, I want to get where I have more people on the screen. Can I do this? If I get rid of you all, I'm in really deep, you know what? So let's see what happens. Oh, okay. I yeah, so if you change it, did you change it to gallery view there? If you go up in the right corner in the little. Yes, I know. I'm trying to, I'm trying to do this, but once again, you got to remember, I'm really terrible at this. Okay, well, I guess that's cal kind of cal gallery view. Okay, let's see what we got. Super. All right. Anyways, so so much for my ability to do technology. So what you have before you here is the substance Chardonnay. I started making this wine as a as kind of an answer to the uh, the sounding popularity. Uh, the people that are buying my wine that I'm making the wine for have really liked the substance Cabernet Sauvignon. And I hope you're familiar with the wine which is the first wine that I started in this project called Wines and Substance, which I started from the 2013 vintage. I decided to add Chardonnay to the, eight, to the lineup in the 18 vintage. And the reason why I did, I was just asked so many times, like, okay, you've been producing this Cabernet Sauvignon, are you gonna produce another wine? So the answer is, if Cab is king, then Chardonnay is queen or vice versa. Chardonnay is king, Cab is queen, and therefore I needed a companion. So I decided to make Chardonnay. So this is my effort of a really deep, flavorful, balance, very expressive, and hopefully very pleasant wine. So I hope you um, give it a whirl and give it a try. I mean, I'm not gonna tell you what to taste. I mean, everybody has their own palate and their own nose and you have your own way of going about it, your own depth of, of knowledge or really how you approach it. And the point is, in, in, in the end, it's just, you know, it's just wine, just drink it, just in, enjoy it. But if you happen to, you know, savor and be a little bit more um, interested more than just as a really tasty beverage, um, you know, you can ponder it just a little bit, but don't overthink. I mean, it's, it's just really delicious. What I find in this wine for myself, I find the wine to be, have an inference of richness. I find the wine to be really smooth, a lot of balance, and almost where your mouth is salivating, because there's really great uh, pH and acid to the wine. So the idea is your mouth is asking for more. And therefore, like with food, it would be absolutely delicious uh, simply because it has this freshness and this focus, but it's the same as almost having a luxurious aspect to it. What's nice about this wine, the way that I produce it, you can drink it young now, like it is, or you can forget a few bottles in your your wine basement, your wine cellar, your wine cabinet, your wine closet, you know, your closet where you keep your boots and your coats before you go outside to freeze your <laughs> in New Hampshire during the winter time. Um, you can put your stash a few bottles away and come back to it in a couple of years and you should get something really absolutely terrific. I mean, um, I know this is the case because I actually have a, a library of my wines. I started producing wine and 1999, and uh, and I've been, you know, I originally started with, you know, uh, what was five thousand dollars borrowed in a 1987 Chevy Astro van. My first vintage with 330 cases. Now um, I produce more. My goal was you know, to make a couple thousand cases of wine a year, perhaps meet a local girl and have a family. Um, and it turned out very differently. Now I make more wine. <laughs> and uh, quite prolific when it comes to different projects, which is nice why we get to try a few different things. Um, but my idea has always been is that, you know, my dream was to make wine. And I, I, I make wine for you. I make wine for the people, if you will, for everyone. And the idea is I do it within my own integrity and what I think is my own, you know, sense of uh, right and wrong. The idea is um, I wanna do the absolute best work I can for the people that are drinking my wine. I mean, let's, let's face it. I mean, if you break it, break it down to the most basic thing, you know, it's kind of like, if you guys buy my wine, it pays my mortgage, pays for my daughter going to the optometrist this morning. You know, it, it, it pays for my health insurance. It helps, it employs everybody that works in my company. So the thing is we want to show up every day and do the right thing. And where we start first and foremost is doing the right thing, which is in the wine, which is what you're going to spend your hard earned money on. I mean, I never made $50,000 a year myself until 2005 when I was 40, 43, 44 years old. So the thing is I knew how to find really good wine within the wine set of, of a wine shop, uh, some because I was really passionate about wine. 
but I think everybody should have good access to good wine no matter how much money they have. And so my goal as a winemaker and being able to be uh, so prolific with making wine is do the best wine work that I can for you. So I just wanted to let you know kind of like what, I don't really have a mission statement or something, but it's really kind of how uh, I, I take everything going forward. So just to understand about the, um, the idea of like, you know, if I say I make wine for you, um, I make it in a style that I think has the integrity that, owns, that lives up to your expectations and hopefully beyond what you ex you, you, your expectations were that I'm making wine that you find that's absolutely delicious. Because for me, it's an honor to be able to do this for my life's work. Charles, so I hope you enjoyed the Chardonnay. We, we have a couple questions on the Chardonnay actually. Sure. Uh, so someone is asking, does Chardonnay take, the, is it a longer process to produce Chardonnay? And then Michael also wants to know if your Chardonnay, how long you age it for, and is it in um, oak or stainless steel? Okay. Uh, what's the first question again? Um, does it take longer to um, process Chardonnay? Um, no, it doesn't necessarily take longer to process Chardonnay. I mean, you can do Chardonnay in a number of, of ways. I mean, you can do it in stainless steel, uh, which I typically do not do, uh, but you can ferment it in barrels as well. Um, Making white wine actually in some way regards is very is more difficult than making red because you got to really predict from oxidation. So, uh, but the uh, white wines are just uh, uh, for as far as uh, making them, they take as long as they take uh, to make reds. And um, secondly, the other question was, I have a short tension span apparently today. That's okay. It was um, whether it was oak or stainless steel. Okay, this wine has been done in wood and in neutral barrels, and it's or the texture more than it's from anything else. Because when you have wines just in stainless steel, you can get this kind of tanky kind of hardness to the wines. I don't know if you, you, know, you, you have experienced that yourself, but I want the wine to have kind of a, a, a softness and a richness to them. And sometimes it's really hard to accomplish that in stainless steel. Thank you. Yeah, good questions. I, it's beverage time. This is the, uh, the, the, I should have a musical interlude, but I don't. I don't know what my, my wine drinking music would be today, but it might have ukulele, I'm not sure. I would offer to sing, but that would just frighten everybody. So we'll, uh, we'll spare you all. Spare us, I greatly appreciate that. So I um, decided to show this with another Chardonnay from my 100% Chardonnay project called Sixto. The idea here was in um, 2012, or just a little bit before then, I thought, well, I hadn't had that many really terrific Chardonnays from Washington State. Not saying that I have not had uh, a number of them, but I didn't really think I had, there, there could be more to be done. Renu Layton, who's a winemaker who also works with me, who's, I think is one of the most talented winemakers in the US, and perhaps the best white winemaker in the US as far as I'm concerned. And the idea was here, um, he used to work for Chateau St. Michel. And the thing is Chateau St. Michel is the biggest winery in Washington state and covers all the spots. So essentially there's a lot of vines that were planted willy nilly in some great spots and not so great spots as, as the whole Washington state wine thing developed. Um, you know, cause you know, relatively new, so to speak in the world of wine. So what it was, was we found out that there were some vines that had been getting quite old and that they weren't really producing enough grapes for large production, what you would have for a larger company, but uh, that they might be more or less, you know, kind of forgotten. So the idea here was to search out the best sites of high elevation and old vine Chardonnay that could be possibly available to us in Washington state and produce the wine. Started by identifying three different vineyards. One is called Frenchman Hills, which is really not that old. It's about 29 years old north facing slope and the Frenchman Hills area up to 1700 feet elevation on basalt soils, which are the volcanic rock. Now going to the Yakima Valley, there's a vineyard called Rosa. And that vines, as I mentioned earlier, in the, that also exists in the uh, substance is uh, almost 50 years old now and is completely chalk. I mean, white chalk, like the cliffs of Dover type white, like the white pocket doors behind me, that kind of white, it is chalk. And literally adjacent to the vineyard, there's a small uh, quarry, if you will, where they used to mine for chalk that was used for chalkboards for ch children to write on chalkboards in school. So we're talking white is the driven snow. 
So that is completely a chalk driven terroir uh, Chardonnay that's in this wine. And then likewise, the vineyard that I was telling you about called Moxie, which is all limestone and broken basalt. So limestone soils, which you find very predominantly like you do uh, chalk, which you'll find in Chablis and limestone also you find in Chablis and also in the great vineyards of Burgundy. Um, so that, those vines now are just pushing on 60 years old. And we went and we found these wine, vineyards. We found them, we identified them, we, we put them under contract. We, we retrained them. We, we redid the soils, we got them ready. And basically we took these vines that were older and we hit the refresh button to give them another 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years of life to make vines that actually have been hanging on through history of Washington State winemaking and then bring it and put it in the glass for you to drink. So then this Chardonnay, as I said, consists of those three different vineyards. Um, this wine is fermented 50% in concrete and it's also fermented in barrel. It's allowed to go through 100% malolactic fermentation, secondary fermentation, if you will. And the idea here is to, to find the wines that are really uh, tasty, really uh, focused, really distinct, and really, this is a, in my opinion, a really absolutely terrific example of Washington Chardonnay and what the potential for Washington Chardonnay is. So if you don't already have it in your glass, I strongly, I mean, I repeat, I strongly recommend that you put some wine in your glass because it's so much better to put it in your glass because for, from there, that point, it's so much easier to put it in your face. So I highly recommend that you try pouring the wine in your glass. And if you can see, it has a beautiful color. I know you have one of your own, but this one is mine. Uh, and you can find the wine in the nose to be a little bit more restrained than the uh, substance Chardonnay. Um, but what you'll find is that it has this beautiful, uh, I mean, I think it first jumps out with you is kind of like this limestone chalk aromatic, maybe a little bit of lime leaves, maybe a little, like satsuma, you know, kind of like a, you know, like tangerine uh, peel. And then there, there's just this depth of, you know, kind of this potpourri of other arom ar ar aromatics uh, that I find. And I think it's, you know, for wines, for you to discover what you discover in the wines, but um, I hope you enjoy this wine. So what I did was, if you've asked me, well, why did you name it Six Toe? And this is actually the first, for people that have been following my wines, um, I've only been doing black and white labels for a number of years, actually for the first 13 years of making wine. So this was kind of close to black and white, you know, it was about as far as I was, uh, you know, bold enough to venture at the time. But the idea here was six toe. So why is it called six toe? Well, six toe, uh, sextus in Latin means the sixth. So this was actually my sixth project. And at the same time, when I started, the, which is uh, just before the harvest, in 2012, which is the first vintage I made of Six Toe, my daughter Charlotte was born. Um, and uh, on uh, October 30, I mean, August 31st, 2012, just prior to her being born, I was at this movie theater with her mother a couple of weeks before she was being born. And it was kind of a difficult pregnancy and she had, her legs were swollen, her feet really swollen. And we were in this art house cinema in Denver and we walked up the stairs sat down and you know, I had to help her up the stairs because that's they didn't have it, it was an old cinema. And we settled down to watch the film Searching for Sugar Man. And for those of you who may have seen it, it was a um, story, uh, a documentary, if you will, about um, uh, Sixto Rodriguez, Jesus Rodriguez, and how, um, and how there was, it was about uh, rebirth and resurrection. What it is is simply is, this was a man that made a couple of records in the late 60s, um, you know, very promising, thought he was going to be, a, everybody thought he was going to be a big deal, and he kind of just disappeared in obscurity. There was lots of rumors what uh, uh, Rodriguez, whatever happened to him, there was everything from he had committed suicide on, by catching himself on fire, he had, you know, run away, he had, you know, disappeared into the world. There was all these kind of stories about him. And so these Swedish uh, guys decided to, to do this documentary called Searching for Sugar Man, where they actually searched for Sixto Rodriguez. Lo and behold, uh, they found him. But what they also found previously is that Sixto Rodriguez was very, very popular, for exactly, in, example, in South Africa, where he was very meaningful to the people during the apartheid 
um, uh, uh, period and for the, the protest and for a free South Africa. And lo and behold, he was more popular than the Beatles and Elvis. And, lo, and unbeknownst to him, as he was working as a day laborer in Detroit for the last 40 years, un, unknown, unfound, and just there, modestly, respectfully, living his life. So they found him with him, out him knowing that he had been this famous. And there's a point in the, in the film where he returns to South Africa, he plays 17 concerts to over 10,000 people every night with people weeping. They can't believe that this guy is here and they all, they, 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 that he actually existed and somebody that meant so much to him. So for me, it's about this thing that's always been great, but it had to be rediscovered. And so the story of Sitzel Rodriguez, you know, Jesus Rodriguez, he also goes by, is this idea of something that's always great, but needed to be resurrected. And the idea of these old vines, these are vines that had been kind of left to their own devices. And we had to go out and find them and, and give them rebirth. And so if you will, um, you know, so Sixto is a reflection of this idea of uh, rebirth and resurrection. I know I keep counting, uh, repeating that, but if you have the cork in front of you on the top of it, you'll see there's a spiral, which is the oldest symbol to, known to man for rebirth and resurrection. So as we are, you know, as life continues on, go on in this world, and we have children, our children have children, and it keeps playing forward. This is really about uh, the, the, the mortal coil and the whole trajectory of life, being able to go back and, and go forth. And so this is uh, my story of, of Washington Chardonnay, and this is why it's called Sixto. I know a little bit rambling, but hey, you know, I'm in Hawaii, what can I say? Charles, a good story, and, and a couple people, you piqued their interest when you talked about fermentation being in concrete. Could you talk about that a little bit more? I'm having a beverage interlude, thank you. <laughs> All right, um, so the idea of the concrete, what it really does, this is really nice, is the concrete helps accentuate the minerality of the wine. Because it's not lined with epoxy, it's actually concrete. So as we know, concrete is made by the earth and by stones and so forth. And therefore, it's a really, really nice vessel for fermenting and adding you know, that accentuation and also helps in focus of the wine where the barrels might give a, a bigger, creamier texture. The concrete gives it a focus. So if you find with this wine, it's very nice and creamy around uh, you know, the outsides of the wine, and, but in the focus, I mean, in the center, it has a really distinct focus. And that's really what the great part of uh, the, um, the yolk, uh, I mean, the concrete fermenters really play into it with the wines. I mean, this wine would not be that without the vessel we're fermenting in. So it's a very good question. Are there any other questions before yeah, we move um, on? Yeah, James would like to know why Washington State? Why did you choose to start there? All right. Well, you know, I didn't tell a lot about my story, but my story is my story, like we all have our own. Um, first, first and foremost, um, when it was, there was an opportunity to, to be a winemaker in Washington State, I didn't want to be on the end of something, you know, California, I'm a native California, I'm from Sacramento, I love California wines, particularly wines were made in the old days, I'm from Sacramento, so from Sierra Foothills, you go back to the gold rush periods where in Amador, El Dorado County, where uh, Zinfandels were being made, Zinfandels and Barberos, so that part, part has a really uh, big part of my soul. But, you know, California has pretty much turned over every piece of dirt that there possibly is. And lo and behold, in 1999, my friend Suna Wagner and I, who's a singer of this band called the Ravenettes, and I was his manager from since he was 19 years old. I lived in Denmark before I moved back to the United States in 1999 to start my winery. But I was managing independent rock bands, not making any great fortunes, but traveling the world, having a lot of fun meeting a lot of interesting people, hearing a lot of really good music and using some of the things that I experienced from that to play it forward and become part of my wine. But what brought me to Washington State? On a road trip with Suna, we passed through Walla Walla and we met a guy named Robert Ames, who I still know today and in Walla Walla. And he was at a little wine shop called in the building called the Dakers Building. And here we are driving my 87 Chevy Astro van, two-tone burgundy with a cassette deck boom, in your face, uh, we pulled in front of this wine shop and thinking, okay, you know, small wine town, 
where you can ask, um, you know, this wine shop, where's there is a good restaurant? Because, you know, food and wine go together, I figure we get a good answer there. So we walk in there and say, like, hi, you know, we're you know, on this road trip you know, from Denmark, blah, blah, blah. Uh, you know, we've been stopping drinking wines, you know, through California wine country and so forth. We just came from Mexico. Hey, and uh, we got in town. So can you tell us where there's a good restaurant to eat? And he goes, well, there is no good restaurants in Walla Walla. We're like, damn, what are we gonna do tonight? He goes, but I'm having a barbecue tonight and you're invited over. And so we all said, great, we have some great old wines from, from uh, Spain with us, some good wines from El Dorado, Amador County, and we'll bring some wines. Like, yeah, bring a bunch of wine. So we came over there, you know, of course, if you uh, we have a wine shop in the wine town like Walla Walla is, you're gonna have friends that are winemakers or wine growers, of course, that's who's gonna be at dinner. And you know, it's a can casual backyard, you know, friend affair, you know, the kind of things we always have with our friends. But this happens to be a lot of people that you know work with wine, and you know, so it's a casual thing because people bring a bunch of bottles with their intention of drinking everything that possibly is there, um, which is what's really great about hanging out with other wine people, especially winemakers. We have an insatiable thirst and um, bottomless uh, capacity for enjoying wine. I can I can uh, attest to that. I do drink a lot of wine. I I, I confess. My little sidetrack. I was told in the mid nineties, I was hiking in Bulgaria. I was in Bulgaria for th uh, 30 days by myself. I was in a little town called Melnik. Um, I woke up the second, the first morning uh, with a really big head. I was really hung over. And I'm in this little town of about 300 people. I think I'm gonna walk up this canyon, go over these hillsides about six, seven, eight kilometers and walk to this monastery called the Roshan Monastery way up and high in the Pyrenean mountains. Lo and behold, I went up the wrong canyons several times, but eventually found my way. On my way back, I, I stopped to go eat uh, dinner at the only one of two restaurants in the town. And um, I sat there drinking wine. I said, ah, it's so great to see you today. I said, hey, he's like, I said, how's it going for you? I said, oh, it's going really great. We had a great day. He goes, you want some wine? I said, of course. He goes, you know what? I was wondering how you felt today. He goes, why? He goes, we've never seen anybody drink this much wine in our life. I said, well, can you tell me how much wine I drank last night? He goes, you drank seven liters by yourself. I said, that's all? He goes, yes, and you had a really great conversation with us and you managed to make it over to your house. We were just wondering how you did. And I said, I'm doing great. So anyways, that was a sidebar. I have a great capacity. I like drinking wine. So let me take you back to Walla Walla and that barbecue. So during this barbecue, I mean, we introduced meeting people, you're know, hanging out, there's music playing, there's some food, everything comes off the grill later because everybody's drinking a lot. And I settle in and I, and I meet this French winemaker. And because, you know, he'd been living, you know, he's from Champagne and he'd been living in uh, Walla Walla, you know, he's very interested in meeting a couple of guys that are, you know, from Europe. And because, you know, you're in Southeast corner of Washington state, very, very rural, um, you just like to you know, be able to mix it up and ask me, hey, what's, What's the word in the new, the old world? So I have a great conversation. And then uh, towards some time in the evening, he turns to me, he goes, he goes, you should move to Walla Walla and make wine. And I said, well, I really love to, uh, but I don't have any money. He goes, huh? He goes, but I have grapes. And I'm like, congratulations. He goes, yes, but I will give them to you and you can pay me back when you sell the wine. I'm like, Sounds pretty good. He goes, yeah, you move here and we can kick and kick and kick all the old guys. And I'm thinking, what does that actually mean? It's coming out of some five foot three French guys who just wants to kick and kick all the old guys. What he simply meant was, um, you know, is come, you know, in, in, that we'll stand up and make the wines that we want to make and the vision that we want to make them. And at that point, because on that road trip, I was trying to decide whether I was going to stay in Europe or move back to the US. And this, and I was on a, a, a journey, if you will. And then what I learned, what would behold, I ran, I, I stopped at the right wine shop in the right town, got it right, the right barbecue, and the right person showed up who offered me grapes and allowed me to pay it back when I sold the wine. And this, without this, I would not be here today. So this is my, my wine journey, and this is how I get here. And so to share this with you uh, is kind of really how um, I got started. Um, I worked in wine from 20 to 40, I uh, came to my way of hospitality uh, industry. A lot of people work in restaurants. And um, I worked at a place that was a French continental place, you know, the old style of dining where you had a maitre d', a captain, 
front waiter, back waiter, bus boy. And um, the first day I went to apply and her worked in a restaurant. I walked through the kitchen. It was hot. Some, it was hot and I realized that I don't want this job. It's, it's hot, you get paid the least, you work the longest hours and somebody yells at you for 10 hours. I'm like, I don't want this job whatsoever. I walked out in the dining room, I hear the soft music, it's all nice and clean. I hear the clinking of the glasses and the silver and everybody's dressed nice. I was like, this looks really good. And then I realized, I found that everybody walks home every day with tips, cash in your pocket. So after about a month working there as a back waiter, I, I realized there's this one other person I've never met. They come in late, they leave early. They have this medal, like they won some award somewhere around their neck all night and they get to drink all night. And I'm like, I want their job. And that was the wine guy. So I became a wine director, you know, even at Ritz Carlton hotels back when, you know, when I was 24 years old. And this was going to be my life path, but moving to Europe, I wasn't able to get a job in wine. So I started in working in a bar, started managing, rock, uh, booking rock and roll bands, started managing, and this was my path. And this stop in Walla Walla was my return uh, to wine, to where I really was to revisit and have the opportunity to do what I was always, maybe knock on wood, I was meant to do. Like if you put a thousand post-it notes up on the wall and they all have a different occupation, I close my eyes and pick one out the wall. Mine said winemaker. And I feel very fortunate that I probably picked the thing I was supposed to do. And I'm very thankful for you to be able to do it. I don't know where that came from, but I thought I'd just share it with you anyways. Great so story. I hope, you, I hope you enjoy the Chardonnay. Okay, I know this is my wine, but it's so good. Right? It is. I mean, it's my wine is really good. Beautifully right now. It doesn't make me a wonder, wonderful human being or anything else or more handsome or more anything. All it is is like the wine happens to be delicious. Let's just call it as it is. So I hope you enjoyed the white wine portion of this program. Of course, I make other white wines. My other project, my Vino wines, where I make single vineyard Pinot Grigio and beautiful Rosé of San Giovese. Just, and also my K wineries, where I make a single vineyard Viognier's. But, and of course, you know, for those who've had some of my wines in the past, you know, I started the brand House Wine in 2004 and I sold it to a company called Preset Brands in 2007. I didn't know you could sell companies. I figured that was really cool when I figured out you can do that, but I did that. And, but that was always known for red wines if you know the house wines from back then or the ones that you know today. And of course, uh, I started Charles Smith Wines in 2006, where I was making white wine, if you know a wine called Kung Fu Girl, I started making Riesling back in 2006. And um, once again, I learned that you could sell brands and I sold that to Constellation Brands in 2016. So I love white wine. Um, uh, white wine actually is in a lot of ways a lot more difficult to make um, because of uh, the oxidative nature of the, the grapes and trying to really strike a really good balance. So a lot of times you can find in white wines, particularly in Riesling, you find sugar. And so the idea is if you have like 20 different lots of wines and you're finishing fermentations, all different sugar levels, different acids, how do you get them all together in the end where it's perfectly balanced? So it can be quite difficult. And this is something that I'm still you know, learning to do and even though I'm in 20 years into my winemaking. So um, let's switch over to the red wines. I found myself a Nice big kind of, you know, I moved from my burgundy glass because I'm being fancy. And um, I moved to my uh, nice little red wine glass. Um, the Vino uh, red wine, Rosa, the, or the, what do you call the Cabernet Sauvignon uh, Sangiovese, came out of the idea that um, in general with Vino, and like I said earlier, um, I want everybody to have access to good wine no matter how much money they have. I think the wine should be infinitely pleasant to drink. Um, I really like, uh, for me per personally, I really enjoy Chianti. Obviously, with Cabernet Sauvignon's dominant is not Chianti style, but I like the style of wine. And you have the area called Bulgari, where they make the super Tuscan wines. And I, this is based kind of on the same idea here. So it's a combination of Cabernet Sauvignon and Sangiovese. In my wines, if it's more than one varietal, it's co-fermented. In other words, I harvest them, bring them in, and put them in the same fermenter. And um, I don't do any blending in the end. So this is my, uh, my example of um, 
you know, the uh, Rosso, which is 70% Cabernet Sauvignon and 30% um, uh, Sangiovese. What you'll find is the wine has a beautiful color. It's very vibrant and very alive. Um, I do this wine in um, stainless steel, let it sit on, on, the, on the gross leaves. I don't, uh, I don't rack my wines. I let them sit next to, you know, think about this wine way, like with steak, you know, we think about beef and they always say the meat is sweeter, closer to the bone. It's more flavorful. Well, wouldn't you also think that if you're making wine and you don't take every, all of its natural components out the skins in particular, that the wine sitting on that and the, uh, the sediment uh, and what's left over uh, from after fermentation that might add to texture and taste and depth of complexity? Of course it does. And so this is what I do. I don't rack any of my wines. They sit uh, after being pressed, the red wines, um, they sit uh, and you go to tank or barrel, they sit dirty, which means they sit on the, the sediment. I let them stay there, un, unstir. I don't stir any of my wines, there's no batonage, and the whites are reds because I don't want to induce any more oxygen. And the idea here is to develop as much flavor and for the wine to take on a life of its own and to be good and to live in the barrel undisturbed. And the same thing that I do in the tank. But I think um, if you want to raise this uh, wine to your nose, if you haven't already done so, I mean, it's very pleasant. I mean, dark cherry, uh, tobacco, pipe tobacco, maybe a little um, sandalwood, perhaps a little suede, if you will, uh, or whatever you taste in it for, for sure. But um, why don't you give it a little taste and see what you think? There, wasn't that satisfying? It was for me, how was it for you? Nevertheless, for me, I found the wine to be seamless. I found now my mouth is salivating, it's full of flavor. The flavor continues to go on and on and on. And you, you know, and is the wine big? Why does it need to be big? It just needs to be mouth filling. This wine is full of flavor. It allows room for whatever you're going to eat. It could be a beautiful, beautiful spaghetti bolognese, it could be a, a burger, it could be a nice little steak with tater tots. I have a year old steak and tater tots, you know, and uh, you know, a little sauteed spinach for me, not for her apparently, because she's eight. Um, and you know, the idea is a wine that's just really pleasant that delivers like the things that I was talking about, pretty much one, two, and three for sure. And for a very modest price, I think the wine is really, really delicious. Once again, a wine like this, you can forget about three years from now and, you know, for the price of what you'd have to pay for it. And the thing about it is, you know, you come back to it and you get a wine that's worth twice as much as what you, you paid for it when you purchased it. Wouldn't we like all our investments to be worth double three years down the road? I think at least it, as far as pleasure goes, that's the way it should, should be done. So I hope you enjoy this wine. Um, you know, it's the vino. Um, you, know, uh, you know, I've been asked, you know, a number of times, what are my favorite wines to make? Um, I don't really have a favorite wine I like to make, but I think, you know, uh, for me, um, you know, I think, uh, for example, you know, I was talking about winemaking. I have a Syrah called Royal City and every year it gets, you know, 98 to 100 points every year. And I've been making this wine since 2006. I'm not saying this to brag, I'm just using it as a point of reference. Okay, and so I make about 600 cases of that. It is easier for me to make this wine than to make you know, let's say if we're talking about some of the white wines, even like the Chardonnay, it's more difficult to make the Chardonnays to get all the different components to fit and in balance and to make a wine of that kind of depth, that complexity that can sell for under $20. That is really the real challenge. So the thing about it is whether I'm making a wine that's, you know, $150 a bottle and 99 points, I'm making a wine that's $12 a bottle and 92 points or 91 points, whatever it may be, somebody's opinion may be, um, I put the same amount of work in it. The only difference between my lesser priced wines and my most expensive wines is the yield in the vineyard. It means the amount of grapes I'm hanging on the vine and the time that I'm aging them in the barrel. That's it. The process is more or less the same. There's no cutting corners. There's no rushing. It takes the time that it takes to make wine. I can uh, tell a story that maybe elaborate a little bit more on this, but we'll get to the next wine and I might tell you this idea, this story about the idea of um, why it takes the time that it takes to make the wine and you can't really rush it.
So I started making these wines, uh, the Casa Smith wines, making single vineyard uh, Barbera and making uh, single vineyard Sangiovese and making single vineyard Primitivo. Um, the idea is um, you say, okay, wow, you made animal labels, how, how original. <laughs> so this is the, uh, the, the uh, Cervo because the idea was I want something that would reference back to Italy. So uh, Barbera, of course, is from the Piemonte area, primarily in Italy. And they have Cervo, which is the deer. So I put the deer on there. And then there's the Sangiovese, which is called Cingale, because we know we've always, we've had the, the wild boar ragu that you'll find in uh, Tuscany. And that, of course, Tuscan, the Tuscan predominant grape is Sangiovese. And then I have this Porscapino, which is a, uh, which is a really weird looking porcupine. I guess if you ask the porcupine, he wouldn't say that he looks really weird. He says, this is what his porcupines look like. And, but they're from Puglia. And so you have this beautiful Primitivo from there. But the wine that we have today is the Barbera. Uh, this comes from Northridge Vineyard, which is a vineyard that's on the ancient soils. Washington State has this thing about sedimentary soils. This is great ice dam that broke in Montana, you know, eons ago, whatever eons means. And it basically broke through and what created and carved all the, 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 the basically the east, of Eastern Washington and, and the Columbia Gorge and the, uh, the Columbia River and really pretty much did all that. So you had all the sedimentary sales, uh, soils that were brought all the way from Montana and they settled in. But above these uh, soils where the water did not reach, you had the ancient soils, which a lot of it is broken basalt. So this comes from the ancient soils, which is primarily broken basalt. It's 100% Barbera. And um, just give it a go. See what you think. Smells deep. Definitely smells complex. Uh, definitely smell that spice that you get in, in Barbera and really some of the, the darker fruit flavors. So um, let's talk about it takes the time that it takes to make wine. All right, so uh, large wineries. I mean, I guess I'm a larger winery with everything that I do, uh, but I mean, I'm not massive. I mean, I'm a sole proprietor. I mean, I own my own winery. I have no partners or investors or anything else. It's just, you know, me from the beginning with all those really nice people that I get to work with that support my, um, my initiatives and my inspiration, what I wanna do. And we all move this thing forward. But the idea here is this, um, I was saying that it it's the same for all my wines. So the thing about my red wines is um, big wineries, they use commercial yeast because it helps ferment, you know, it's a very useful tool. And, you know, and they maybe use a couple other things that extract colors. And then after 10 days, they need to turn their tanks because they're producing a lot of wine. Fermentation time takes time and tanks. Okay, so they, they do this. It's, it's, not, it's, it's, a, it's not really a shortcut, but it's something that's kind of been done more in modern times but it, because it helps the thing along. Well, with ferment, fermentations, they don't go so fast. And the thing is, it may take a little bit of time, so you can't really do it like clockwork. So of course I do native fermentations because I want it to be only the grapes and nothing but the grapes. So what I do where big wineries, they might be pressing the grapes after seven to 10 days because they can turn the tank. If I want to make more wine, I buy more tanks. So what I'll do is I'll taste the wine every day and for my reds, it's always north of over 30 days that I taste the wines. When it doesn't improve for two days, I press it. That's it. It takes the time that it takes to make wine. If you want to rush the process, you get something different. Case in point, do you guys have a legalized marijuana in New Hampshire? Yes, no? Not yet, but we do in Massachusetts where I live. Okay. Now I'm not saying that I smoke a lot of pot and I don't actually. I thought when I was really young, like, you know, I was like, you know, 1979, I'm listening to Bachman Turner Overdrive. I'm like, man, I love marijuana. I'm gonna smoke this my whole life. And now it's legal and I don't even ever smoke it. So, but my point being is this, okay. It takes the time that it takes to make wine. So the thing is when it's done, it's done. And for me, it's done when the wine gets very smooth, the tannins are really refined, there's more depth and complexity. I liken to this, let's just say you went to your legal marijuana store wherever you live, in a neighborhood near you. And you go there and you buy some pot. And you go home and you go, oh, hey, okay, let's bake a cake. 
So you get the, your Betty Crocker Duncan Hines cake mix and you make up the cake, you pour it in the thing, it says 350 for 45 minutes. And you're like, do 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 do. Hey, what about that pot we just bought? All right, let's roll a joint. So you like, roll a joint. Remember, it's legal. Okay, so this is a legal story. You roll a joint, you like, smoke the joint. About 25 minutes, you're like, hey man, this smells good. What about that cake? <laughs> let's go get some of that cake. And you go there, it's like, okay, like, yeah, I want, I mean, I can't wait, I'm gonna get some cake. So you cake the cake out at 30 minutes, and you put it on the counter because you want to eat cake. But guess what? At 30 minutes, you don't have cake. You just jump the gun because you really want it sooner than it could be done. What I'm saying is it takes the time to make cake. It takes 45 minutes. Just because you will it to be something else doesn't mean it'll be what it's going to be. So making wine, in my opinion, it takes the time to, it takes to make it, and there is no deviation from that. I don't know whatever the, the story about marijuana came from, but you know, I hope you enjoy it today. So I want to try the wine, as I hope you do. It's got a beautiful color. Once again, very vibrant, very shimmering and kind of live in the glass. A lot of energy, really fresh, complex, a lot of spice, a lot of boysenberry, blueberry, blackberry. Um, it's very kind of primary right now. It's a young wine, you know, develop a lot more depth. There's kind of some black leather behind there and definitely some earthy tones to it, but absolutely delicious. Single vineyard, Barbera, grown in the Wauwook Slope on the ancient soils. And these vines are pushing 25 years old and um, I'm the only one produces wines from these vines. The one thing also that you know, point out about my wines that you may not be aware of, you're not that familiar with my wines, is I produce a lot of single vineyard wines. The majority of all the wines I produce are single vineyards, whether it be at $12 a bottle or $150 a bottle. Why? Because I think the more, uh, the, the more distinctive you can make the wines, the more that they're elevated and more uh, individual and potentially more interesting. So I like the fact that I make wine, you know, not that we're tasting today. For example, I, I go back to the vino wines. I make single vineyard Pinot Grigio, single vineyard wine for $12. And if you like the wine, I think it's pretty cool that there's one spot on the earth only where that wine comes from. I don't make beer, I make wine. Wine just comes from the earth. Now, you know, the thing is, you know, I'm not putting down the beer makers, I love beer love to drink it. People that are passionate about beer, they should make beer. People that are about, passionate about spirits, they should make spirits. I'm passionate about wine, I make wine. So you want a winemaker that loves wine to make your wine. I want a beer maker that's all about the beer to make my beer. Somebody that's so into Mezcal or Cognac or Calvados that they make it, that's the producer I want to meet. That's the one like, yes, they're my person because I know that they love doing this and it's what they want to do more than they want to do anything else. And for me, making wine, I can't imagine that I do anything else besides what I do because this is what, you know, is, is what I, I feel I was meant to, to do. So if there is any questions about the bar bear or the idea of drinking really nice uh, Italian varietals from Washington State, I'm happy to hear them. The one thing I want to point out and I'm going to definitely point out when we're going to get to the Pinot Noir is where we are. We are continental climate. We are inland. We're not coastal like a lot of California areas or Oregon. We have great growers, great winemakers working really hard every year, improving their wines, working harder on it. We're inland. So it's really important that when you think about that is, you know, to be inland and more continental. And then what you do is you don't have the same um, influence that you get from the marine climates. A lot of times it's warmer, it's a lot of more consistency. Uh, you don't get rained out, if you will. Um, you know, and you, you, where you get kind of these up and down vintages. We're very fortunate in Eastern Washington that we have that. Secondly, we're at the same latitude as, as for, for example, for um, my, my, my more Rhone-centric wines, Wall Wall is like at the 46th parallel, which is what you find that really runs, runs through the Rhone. 
where my project we're going to talk about a little bit, which is my Golden West, we're at, we're at the same latitude as Pomard. So what do you think about this? We're in continental climate, which all the great wines of Europe primarily are. We're also at the same latitude. And then we'll get to the soils in a bit, but we have very, very distinctive soils. So for sure, a Barbera from Washington State at the same you know, kind of area of the same latitude makes a whole lot of sense for producing uh, aromatic and delicious and deep Italian varietals. Charles, one quick question, which is actually a great question, especially regarding your wines, is sure. how should consumers regard wine ratings? When you're producing such great quality wines at pocketbook friendly prices, how should they look at those ratings? Well, I think, I mean, it's a great question because actually I have to think about this for a moment. Um, I want to give a thoughtful answer. Um, okay. Liken it to a, a movie critic. I mean, you know, if, if you like to see cinema, I like to see films. There are some, some critics, they really like action movies. Some like romantic comedies. They, they, they'll give more stars to the action movies because they like that than the romantic comedies. It's just not their thing. So the thing is, you really need to know your wine writer and know what their opinion is. Like, if they don't like big, strong, tannic wine, and you and, and and they give it a low point and you happen to, it doesn't really line up because it's it'll really it comes down to one person's opinion. Not everybody is like, you know, opinion, you know, their opinions are balanced based on more objective. It's based on their perception and their opinions. So really I think it's important for you really to know the the wine the wine writer and knowing what they like or don't like. And then you find a wine writer whose wines align with his, their, his or her opinions align with what your opinions are. Because then therefore that will do it. I mean, one person's opinion is, is so different on the same one, so different on the other opinions. But the thing is one be, might be more aligned with the other. Um, so that's that. Um, there's also the idea, you know, there's all that, for example, with Rosé. So this is something that kind of takes it out of context what we're talking about. Um, when, when we, when we as winemakers think about uh, uh, wine writers um, uh, rating rosé, it's almost like they immediately take five to 10 points off the scale. It becomes a 95 point scale. I mean, when's the last time you see a 97 point rosé? Never. Now, have you had what you would consider an absolutely perfect rosé? I am sure you've had absolutely delicious rosé, but you'll never see, see a 97 point rosé. So the idea is, you, is already the scale has, you have to understand the scale and how they're approaching it. So really, you know, I think you have to take it with a grain of salt. And I think you have to know the wine writer and you have to know the wine producer. And, and it's a little bit kind of complicated. And I think you'd only kind of get it over a period of time and a long time of uh, being interested in wine. Um, I think what's really great right now, we have our cell phone, we can punch up and get information and get a little bit more kind of broader and more honest opinions maybe be by the consumer. And I don't think like Yelp or something like that, but you go to like, a, what is it called? Um, not wine searcher, but uh, uh, seller raters, right? Is that what it is? Seller, that one? Yeah, you can go up there and you put a punch in wine, you know, and then you can get a number of people's uh, opinion on the wine. And that'll give you a little more basis of making opinions. I mean, yeah, it's really great when I, you know, make a wine that sells for you know seventeen dollars a bottle, like the next wine we're going to taste, and I get ninety, you know, one to ninety-three points every year for a, you know, seventeen dollar seventeen dollar bottle of wine. Yes, it helps the sales, but on the other hand, you know, people that know my wines, whether I get eighty-nine points or ninety-three points for that wine, they should know that Charles Smith made this wine. If they know my wines and they know that it's going to be good because they know that I have integrity and that every year, you know where, you know, no matter if it's a great vintage or not, I'm going to be at the top level of the wines produced because that's the way I'm going to make my adjustments so I can make the best wine of the vintage. And there's other producers that you feel about that in the world. And therefore, those are the wines that you almost feel that are bulletproof. Because that's how I approach wine wines that I like to drink and from producers that I know that if they made it, I know it's good. Because no matter what, they've adjusted uh, their method for that vintage to produce the best thing that's absolutely possible. Yeah. Long answer. <laughs> that's the best I can do. So we have the wines of substance Cabernet Sauvignon. So
So, <coughs> excuse me. It's actually been raining for the last three days. So got a little congestion. Um, this is, anyways, this is a 2018 Cabernet Sauvignon. So for those of you uh, have tried it, I hope you enjoy it. The ones that you drink it frequently, thank you very much. My car payment is coming up pretty soon, like in a few days, I need to make it. So keep buying my wine so I can make my car payment. So uh, there's the Cabernet Sauvignon. So here's the deal. Um, I decided to make the Cabernet Sauvignon when I, I started uh, working with this brand, which has started in 2013. I had to make a decision. Uh, what kind of Cabernet Sauvignon is it gonna make? What do the people like? I'm once again, I know it might sound cliche or whatever, I am making the wine for everybody that's here on this call and everybody else. Because you know what, once again, I mean, I'm not, if I'm making it for myself, I'm making a couple barrels a year. I mean, I cannot drink as much wine I make. Absolutely, no matter how, how you know, bravado I, I speak and how much I say I can consume, it is literally impossible. So the thing is, so I have to think, what kind of wine do I want to make for you? And I think, well, what do you want? Nobody like sends in their requests like, hey, this is Charles at W, W-I-N-E radio, what would you like to hear tonight? I'm not doing that. I have to think like, okay, what does people want to drink? But the thing is, what I'm, what I'm thinking of this is this, I'm going to make Cabernet Sauvignon. For me, there's two primary uh, styles of Cabernet Sauvignon. And, and I'm talking about the grape itself. There's more red fruit, red currant, red cherry, uh, mineral, um, um, tobacco leaf, pencil lead, delicious. And there's also the more black fruit version of Cabernet Sauvignon, more blackberry, chocolate, tar, earth, pencil lead, you get the idea. So the more bright style, mineral, delicious, the more black, more brooding style of Cabernet Sauvignon. So I decide what do I want to make? What do the people want? And so the idea here was this. I decided what I make, what I base, what I think people prefer the most. Now on my screen, I have no idea why I only have six little boxes. But the thing is, we all know this last year has been an election year, big year, lots of people vote, don't wanna care, don't care about your opinions, don't want, this is not about that. But the thing is, if you, if you don't vote, shut up. We don't wanna hear what you say. You gotta vote to give you, if you wanna have to be in the conversation, vote. No matter who you vote for, what you vote for, you gotta vote, otherwise forever, hold your peace. So here's the deal. Amen. <laughs> Here. This is not political. This is just about, yeah, you know, you're going to have your opinion, vote. So we vote, we've all voted. I'm sure everybody here on this call voted. So here's the deal. If you prefer, okay, so I can't see as many as I like to see. So, Charles, so I think prefer, that the, all prefer, of the participants' cameras are not on, but they can see you. Can, they, can just, you guys turn those cameras on? Can they? No, because it's like a live feed and um, okay. Facebook going live. We don't know what everybody out there. It's here. Next time, it's crazy and fun. Revolution. You're gonna put your camera on, and we can all see each other. And that's the way we're gonna do this thing. No, no. Anyways, so here's the deal. So by a show of hands, which we won't really work because we only got this six of us on the screen, is who prefers a more red, bright fruit version of Cabernet Sauvignon? Raise your hand. Okay. Who prefers the more black fruit version of Cabernet Sauvignon? Raise your hand. If you don't vote, and you wait, can you try it. Um, if you don't vote, you don't, don't care. Dave, you don't care. I can see you guys. Okay, who prefers the red fruit version of Cabernet Sauvignon? More bright, more mineral. Who prefers the black fruit version of Cabernet Sauvignon? Raise your hand. Okay, you get. So, which one do you think I decided to make? I only contracted vineyards. Grapes from vineyards that have a black fruit profile, because that's consistently the wine is going to make. You cannot make one thing from a different type of grape. It is you're going to grow it the wine. You're not making the wine. So the only vineyards that I have for this wine are produced from vineyards that have a black fruit profile, also that have a very strong terroir imprint, whether it be uh, broken basalt, whether it be river rock, gravel. You get the idea. So that there be a very strong earth element to the wine. This wine is 100% whole berry, Cabernet Sauvignon, only for vineyards that produce a black fruit profile. It is fermented on native 
uh, natively by, by indigenous needs, so native fermented. It is macerated, means fermentation time on the skins greater than 30 days, pressed off, put to barrel dirty, 100% in barrels, rested for 13 months, topped every four weeks, drawn off, assembled, and bottled, either uh, filtered or unfiltered and fine. I produce more of this vintage, of this wine, more unfiltered and unfine. This wine had produced over 300,000 cases of native fermented, black fruit profile, barrel aged, unfiltered, unfined Cabernet Sauvignon that is the real deal in your glass. It's nothing but the grapes and the vessel they're resting in. Now, am I bragging? No, I'm just making a point. What else do you want in the wine besides the grapes and the vessel they're resting in? Nothing. And that's what you deserve. I mean, we push our carts through the grocery stores and we buy you know, cage-free eggs and free-range chickens and organic broccoli and you you get the whole thing. And then we drive, we put our cart through the wine section and it's like chemistry set everywhere. Mega purple, ferment, you know, native, you know, uh, adjuncts, uh, all kinds of crap. And the thing is, shouldn't you want the same thing from your wine as you want from everything else you have? Because we all think it, isn't it just wine? Should be, it's not. I believe it should be, so that's what I do. So this is my substance Cabernet Sauvignon. It's a wine of substance because it's a wine of integrity that I made in a profile, but I think the majority of the people want, which is a black fruit, fruit profile of wine. That's it. It's really simple. Wine has been made for, for ages. I'm just part of this whole thing. I'm here making you know, wines. I'm 59 years old. I have to hope to be here for another 40 years. And then you know somebody at some point in time will continue my winemaking perhaps, and hopefully it'll be my daughter Charlotte who's now eight. And um, but the thing is, this is my life's work, and shouldn't I do my best work because I'm doing it for you? This is the greatest honor that I get to. This is what I'm most proud of. Not the 99 points, not you know the cover of the magazines and all this other stuff and articles and you know making a bunch of money and so forth. My dream was to make wine. That's it. I get to do exactly what I want to do, whether I made a, a fantastic income or a modest income, it doesn't matter. I'm very, very fortunate to do what I want to do. And this is my important work that I get to share with you. It's, it's, it's an honor. I can't believe I get to do this with my life. There you go. So I hope you enjoy the wine. Balanced, silky, seamless, Cabernet Sauvignon, because that's what it says on the bottom. If on any of my wines, it says the rattle at the front. If on the back, it doesn't say, you know, 80% Cabernet Sauvignon, 20%, you know, Merlot, Syrah, or whatever, it's always 100%. Truth in advertising, say what it is, be transparent, be honest, be real, and that's what this wine is. So it's 100% barrel aged Cabernet Sauvignon from vineyards that produce a black fruit profile. There you go. Like I said the only difference between this wine is yield in the vineyard and the time in barrel. I have vineyards that I make this wine from that I'm sure that when they get old, the vines get old and they're only produced in two, two and a half tons of the acre, that they'll be producing, you know, 95 to 98, 99 point wines. I've only planted new vineyards in the places that I thought are the best sites to do that. It's kind of like Johnny Appleseed. You got to plant for the future. You don't plant just for now, but for the next generation. So they'll say, well, God, who put that vineyard in, in the ground? It's like Charles Smith did 40 years ago, and we get to reap the benefits of it. I get to be part of this cycle of life and this part of uh, winemaking, and uh, that's a really great place to, to be. So... With that being said, I don't know what the time is. Am I overrunning time? I don't even have a clock. We're running a little late, but that's okay. I know you have one bottle left. We're okay. Oh, we are late. Oh, sorry. Did I say sorry. I'm I'm over by 11 minutes. I know this run really long. I will try to rush for the next one. I'm really sorry. You know, since we can't see you, you guys could be eating dinner and so forth while you're doing this. You, you know. TV tray, you know, 
having a delicious something. Um, but let's have this delicious something. And this is probably gonna take me about 10 minutes to, to tell you about, even though we're running over. So please forgive me, everyone. I know I Okay, here we go. All right, this is the gold. Oh yeah, can you edit this later or no? It's too late. Maybe. I think we like the raw form, it's okay. All right, well, there you go. We're all adults here because I know you have to be 21 and over to enjoy these tasty beverages. So this is my, my Pinot Noir. 100% single vineyard Pinot Noir from Washington State. Why Washington? Well, hell, I live there, so why should I go somebody else to make Pinot Noir? Secondly, I was telling you, it's the same latitude as Pomard. It's the same growing cycle season within one degree of what is produced in, uh, uh, in Gere, Gere Chambardin, the really delicious wines of Burgundy. And the soils are limestone. Primarily the limestone soils are primarily where the white wines are in Burgundy, but except in Vos, Vos Romanae, uh, which produce some of the greatest wines in the world, very highly perfumed and delicious. This vineyard is over 55% limestone. And once you get up the first cruise, we're up the hillsides in Vos, they're over 53% limestone. We are what we eat, and these grapes actually are living in limestone, which is exactly what you have intercontinental. We're about 420 miles away from the Pacific Ocean. Burgundy is 271 miles away from the Atlantic Ocean. We're inland. We're not, we're not coastal climate. We're aspect. We're south by south but facing. We're at 1,700 feet elevation. We won't frost. We won't freeze. We're at the same latitude as Pomard, the same soils of Vos, and with one degree of the growing season in Jerry. So what should this wine be like? For the people that have had my Syrah, you will know that the wines are very earth driven. We find that most of our domestic Pinot Noir from really good producers and growers in, in Oregon and California, they're primarily fruit driven. They don't have these soils. This doesn't mean they don't have the passion, they don't have the skill sets, and they don't have the, the, the quality, they do. Oregon makes really great Oregonian Pinot Noir, delicious. Some really awesome produce, some wines that I really love. California, absolutely the same. But the thing is, just because you haven't tried something from Washington doesn't mean it's going to be delicious. Because all the things I just told you kind of uh, uh, sets the table for what you're going to taste. So if you haven't already, uh, please pour the wine in the glass. One thing you're first going to notice is that's the color of Pinot Noir. It's not dark purple. It's not black. Pinot Noir is not that. It's a thin skinned grape that has a lot of energy, a lot of acid and a lot of liveliness and really difficult to produce because it's a very, you know, what do you call it? A fragile grape. I think the first thing you can do if you haven't already done it, you put the wine to your nose. You know what you don't smell? Raspberry, strawberry, fresh fruit, fruit forward. You smell dark components. What you also don't smell is wood. What you don't smell, vanilla. What do you smell? You smell earth. You smell lots of things that are more of that, you know, je ne sais quoi, you know, that, that you know, I do not, I didn't, you know, I, I don't know what. Um, so, you know, I, I remember which wine writer, you know, a long time ago wrote that a really good Pinot Noir is like a woman's evening bag. And of course, you're going back in the old days, but women would, women would carry a little evening bag and it would have, you know, cosmetics, coins, little coins. It might be made out of leather the, and there would be a little bit of perfume. There might be a broken cigarette. And you take that, 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 that bag and you smell it and it is this great deal of complexity where there's not, you can't put your finger on it. And I know, you know, being a, you know, you know, born in 61, my, you know, my mother and her, her sisters, my aunts, and they would be going out and they would have their evening bags and, they, and you know, you know, you have your closet where you have all the clothing and everything else and you have this smell and you have this like where you don't really can really put your finger on it. And I think this wine really has a, a great deal of that. And, um, And I think really what it is is also the thing is the wine should actually have some nerve. I mean, it's Burgundy, it's Pinot Noir. This is Pinot Noir. I mean, it's not Burgundy, it's from Washington State. But the thing is, you know, you know, tasting with James Suckling or, um, uh, you know, some other folks, you know, the first thing they said is like, this is like Burgundy. Well, it's actually like Washington, but nobody knows what Washington Pinot Noir is like. 
I mean, it's not burgundy, but this is what is, what is potential. This was the first vintage, the absolute first year. I can tell you the second vintage is better. This is really good. I mean, 93 points for, you know, $90, $19 bottle or a, a Pinot Noir. Is that how much it costs? I don't know. Did I, did I misspeak? I have no idea. I just, I'm just, I'm just here to represent. You're great. You're killing it, Charles. Every the <laughs> wines are drinking great, and you're fabulous. Everyone's having a good time. Um, and you're, and the you're, chat. You're, you're, I know it's hard to multitask, but the chat is everybody is enjoying it and and picking up what you're putting down. So, as you know, the wine is structure. The wine is complex. It has grip. It's silky. This is what we should expect from. Pinot Noir, which has more than just fruit forward and, and friendly. It should have some gravitas. And you can imagine this wine, forget it in your same thing in your closet, your your wine, your your wine locker, your whatever, your basin. And what would the wine be in a few years? And it should be pretty awesome. And the other thing about this, and the, the label for the first year is a one-off. I've only I decided to do it only a one time only, and I rolled up the label and uh, would you guys, would, would anybody like to see the, the, the next label? You should get this because it's a one-off thing and it's the first wine in the history of what I'm going to do. So if I was to buy anything, I'd buy this wine because it's the first. Would you like to see the other label? Yes? No? Yes, to everybody see. wants to see it. All right. That means talk amongst yourself. I'll be right back. While, while Charles is uh, running to find us the latest label, um, I do want to let everybody know that as... Uh, if you're following us using the Scavify app and participating in that promotion that we do have our code word this evening. And of course, it's very appropriate to tonight's conversation with Charles since his wines are sold in all 50 states and 23 countries. We have double points, 200 points for the Scavify app tonight. And the code word is Washington. So go ahead to the Scavify app and make sure that you key in Washington. And that will be your code. Welcome back. I'm back. So you got the first label, if you have the wine at home, and that's that one. And the next one is, there you go. So I decided to let the sun shine. So I just, I blew it up. So the first vintage is very, this is the first one to come down the line. And this is the second vintage because I kind of wanted the, one, the first wine to be a one-off wine forever and really be the starting point and have it kind of as a snapshot pour right, if you will, to the history of the wine. So if you enjoy the wine, I hope you did. Uh, why Washington Pinot Noir? The proof is in the glass. There's a reason for it. Because if this is a starting point, it should look really, really rosy. I hope there's more uh, producers that decide to come to Washington State and make wine, uh, who come to make Pinot Noir. Uh, you know, come on. We, we, we only want to see you come to Washington State and, and help you know, help us, help me, and uh, and help develop the, the state because there's a lot of great places to to grow grapes, and a lot of great uh, vineyards to be had, and a really good opportunity. I think Washington wine is not just because I'm there making wine, but it's the most exciting place in, in the world right now for wine because it is, is, is endless possibilities. And I think this breadth of what we've tasted, even what we haven't even got into the Rhone centric wines that I produce. Is really a good example of what can be done in Washington State. So you can come to visit me in Jet City. Hopefully, knock on wood, we can travel around our country here in this coming uh, uh, late summer um, and come visit us uh, even further into the future in Walla Walla and so forth. And uh, I've been asked many times, you know, I was like, I'm in my tasting room. I was like, wow, what are you doing here? It's like, well, where the hell am I also supposed to go? I mean, my name's on the building, this is where I'm supposed to be. Um, you know, this is what I, this was my dream. This is what I want to do. And, and I'm happy for being able to spend the time. I'm sorry we ran a little bit over in time today, but there's some of the things that needed to be said. And I said them. If there's any other questions, we can follow up real quickly. And otherwise, we can, we can take off. We have a couple quick ones for you, Charles. Um, so somebody is asking, how long would you store the Pinot Noir for? Oh, I think that one would be awesome about five to eight years from now. What do you think? I mean, don't you kind of feel the same? I mean, I mean, it is earth driven. It, it, it has the structure. Uh, it's not 
big where you feel the wine's going to die sooner. I think it just, it's kind of like, you know, you get a bouquet of, of roses or from a friend or whatever for a, a, a birthday or a celebration and you get, you get, it, you get, it, you know, you get it where they're closed. And you, if you do so, you get a chance to watch them open up over time. And the thing is a wine like this will, is like this right now. It's really delicious. It's really, and it's beautiful, like a bouquet of roses, but you get to enjoy the evolution. Great. Thank you. Uh, we do have a lot of comments, so we'll be sharing with these with you after. We'll send them to Marissa and to Charles, but um, we have the Charles Smith for President campaign that evidently the group is starting, um, or at least the Minister of Agriculture, we were told. Um, you, you have open invitations for dinner, and um, somebody wishes that their college professors were as passionate as and intelligent as you are. So a lot of kudos from our, our audience tonight. So thank you for thank joining you. us on that. Well, like I said, it's a great honor. Um, like I said, I... I sometimes I'm lost for the words. I, I never dreamt that this is where I would end up in my life. And I can't believe that I have an opportunity. You know, I mean, that, you know, thank you for your support there in New Hampshire. I mean, you guys have been really good to me for sure. You know, and I, I just can't uh, thank you enough for the support. Um, I never knew this is where my life would, would uh, lead. I get to meet so many really wonderful people around the country, places that I would never, I imagined I would ever go. You know, people always go to these different cities and in the bigger states, and I end up going to get to go to second and third cities and meet so many wonderful people throughout the country. I've been on the road um, all the time um, because I really enjoy getting out there and, and, like I said, earning every dollar and meeting people around the country. And I'm very, very fortunate to be able to do this. And so, for me, I'm I'm super grateful for this time to be able to spend with you. And uh, I just wish everybody health and safety and you know, and good fortune and hopefully we can see you, you know, later on in this year. And, you know, for those that have been suffering during this time, I mean, my heart goes out to you. And I know it's not been easy for, for us and for our, you know, our friends and our colleagues and for our country, but we'll get through this and we get through this together and we'll hopefully we'll be able to drink a wine together here in the future. And um, once again, I just wish you all the best and thank you for the time. And thank you for um, yeah supporting me and my my people. Thank you so much. And I do want to remind everybody that's joining us tonight that um, all these events have been hosted also by our wine buyers in New Hampshire. So we have Lisa Goslin on tonight. We've had Chad Gibson on, and Lisa and Chad are responsible for tasting these wines and bringing them into New Hampshire for us and making make sure that we get to enjoy them. So thank you, Lisa, for all that. That's wonderful. I don't know if there's anything else you'd like to share, Lisa, with with the audience tonight. Um, sure. So I just first and foremost want to thank Charles. Um, that was such a great presentation and everybody, so many great comments and Charles for president. <laughs> um, so, um, but you can find any of these wines that we've tasted throughout New Hampshire. Um, some of them are a little bit uh, limited, but um, if you want to reach out to us um, and we can show, tell you where you can find these uh, wines. Um, you can also visit our website um, at uh, liquorandwineoutlets.com. Um, and these wines will be on sale till the 31st. And we're also offering um, the coupon um, and that, that will run until um, February 2nd. So be sure that you get those coupons out of your mailbox and get into the stores and buy some of these awesome wines. Um, and I just wanna thank Perfecta as well um, David and his whole staff. Um, so thank you. Thank you so much, Marissa, as well. Um, so it was a great event and thank you so much, Charles. You're welcome. Thank you all our New Hampshire friends and Charles, of course, for taking the time and give Charlotte our best to. Hey, Charlotte. Seattle. Get her over here. I'm like, I can't wait to get out to There's Seattle. No Thanks. We can't get on a plane right now. She's behind me a couple of minutes ago. I thought she was going to just pop up here and, you know, but she, she didn't. So I think she's outside in the garden. So yeah, anyway, um, anyways, you all take care, stay warm, stay safe. Uh, once again, appreciate everything you do for us, me and my family, everybody in the Wiley. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much for joining us tonight. And for everybody, just so everybody knows, Charles was gracious enough to send a few signed bottles and some t-shirts. We'll be drawing names off of the Zoom registration for that to notify that you've won. But thank you so much. That's great, generous. And I know that the passion that you create wine with came through tonight. So hopefully as everybody raises a glass of substance or another wine, they think about these stories and enjoy the wine even more. So thank Absolutely. you everybody for joining us. Be good, be safe.
Thanks, Karen. everyone. Bye. Good night. Good night, everyone. Bye.